Mr. Silton and the others arrived and changed out of their disguises. Although Mr. Preston was moaning as apparently Mrs. Silton had only washed his and Mr. Logan's Halloween costumes. The office was deserted, but it looked like people had left in a hurry, various computers had been left on. Strangely, there were drawings of me everywhere, I hoped the professor could tell me why when we found him. It's strange, none of the machines were totally active, but the power was still on. This all looked very familiar. I would have looked around more, but we needed to find the professor. There were no signs of life, if the professor was living here, he hadn't been here in a long time.
A large piece of machinery blocked our path. Mr. Silton smiled when I asked what we should do next. I knew straight away that he didn't mean Mr. Preston or Mr. Logan when he said, someone's gonna have to climb inside. It seemed we could use the computer to move chunks of the machine around. I knew I needed to make a clear path, as it would be me that would be going through it.
as we entered the extravagant corridor, the most beautiful tune played in the distance. But almost as soon as we began to enjoy its dulcet tones, the music stopped, dead. The professor was dead, but everything seemed wrong, he was old, very old, maybe twenty years older than when I'd last seen him, Mr. Silton sounded very sad, when he said, how did anyone even get in here? I don't know what to do now. I suppose we'll head back to the train station. It was hard to believe the professor was gone. Although he was always suspicious of me, I was sad to think I'd never see him again. Is it? Yes it is. This is the right day. Said the professor as he jabbed at a small metal box. I don't know how much time I've got to explain. He continued as a bright light began to surround everyone. Oh, not long at all. We had reappeared just as smoothly as we had left, but we were somewhere very different. Mr. Preston and Mr. Logan were speechless, but the professor just continued studying his box. Looking back, I suppose I was rather stupid, as I ended up chasing a beautiful butterfly. I was lost but soon I realized I wasn't as alone as I thought. I couldn't believe we had time traveled, but there was no time to sightsee. This seemed quite valuable. prehistoric world looked like paradise, except for the killer cavemen. Now, this was clearly worth something. I would have liked to have a look around, but I had to get back to the others. After literally 10 minutes of Mr. Preston and Mr. Logan saying, Whoa, and, dude, the professor began to explain, Time travel, if I can find the correct point in time, then I should be able to, well, make things better. I suppose it's like we're in that excellent movie, chuckled Mr. Logan. Back to the future? replied Mr. Preston. No, that excellent movie. Back to the future too? Time bandits? Time Cop. Terminator. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. The box let out a loud bleep as the professor gave it a heavy thump. This damn thing's so dependent on the maths used to calculate where the Earth is at any one point in time and space, that it's almost random where we'll end up, or even how long the time window will stay open. That last one was the shortest I've had yet. 
although obviously apprehensive of our situation, I think Mr. Preston and Mr. Logan were too excited to really pay attention. But they were far less excited when I asked what his longest stay was, and the professor replied, about 15 years. I was stranded in ancient Egypt for so long. They had me build them a steam-powered robot. You should have seen the things they had it build. Yes, wonderful things. It was like I was the Loth incarnate, or the modern Prometheus. Speaking of which, robot, have a look around, see if you can find anything to make a fire. As great as my shoes were, they weren't much use when there was nothing for them to stick to. I rolled deep into the cave, but at least I had found the professor some firewood. Now I just needed to get back to everybody else. It may seem ridiculous, but I really did fall this far into the cave. Things started to look familiar. I was pretty sure I was nearly back where I had originally fallen. Everybody warmed themselves by the fire. In the orangey glow, the cave even looked a little homely. Mr. Logan was much more comfortable now that he could see his surroundings, but Mr. Preston kept saying, we're in bloody dinosaur times. The professor laughed. He pointed out that there were 65 million years between dinosaurs and the emergence of man. But that just made Mr. Preston panic about possible dinosaur ghosts. I got the feeling Mr. Logan had heard this kind of talk before, as he sighed when he said, Oh, I suppose you believe in ghosts as well now do you? Well... Yeah, said Mr. Preston, Barry's missus says this bloke who works with her uncle reckons his brother has, fact. And with that, he began to tell the most amazing story I had ever heard. He explained how there was a man traveling through the Black Wall Tunnel, who saw a young motorcyclist stood by a smashed up motorbike, the man stopped, so the motorcyclist told him an address, but when he got in the back of the car, he fell silent, clearly in shock. This isn't a ghost story, interrupted Mr. Logan, this is called giving someone a lift. Mr. Preston was annoyed, Mr. Logan's stupid joke had ruined his train of thought. The brother of a bloke who works with Mrs. Silton's uncle gave a young motorcyclist a lift after a crash outside the Blackwall Tunnel. I said, just happy to be part of the conversation. Yeah, that's it, said Mr. Preston as he explained that when the man arrived at the address, the motorcyclist had vanished. He said the man, not knowing what else to do, knocked on the door of the house. Soon an old lady answered, and when the man asked her if she had a son, she burst out crying and sobbed, I did have, but he died ten years ago today. Just outside. The black. Wall. Tunnel. I couldn't believe my audio sensors, this was concrete proof of the afterlife, I mean, Mr. Logan did point out that the story was from a children's TV show called Grange Hill. But you can't argue with the facts. Soon. The professor had finished inputting whatever data his box needed. Robot, he said, we need to be outside for my computations to be truly accurate. Find us an exit from this platonic allegory. The cave. Find us a way out.
this block looked perfect, so I decided I would only place it where the professor said I should.
well, I've reversed the polarity of the neutron flow, so, here we go, said the professor as the glowing light surrounded us again. This is it, said the professor as he looked around. Oh no, he gasped as his expression became far more serious. It's the wrong time. We had appeared in another barren desert. I was beginning to think that the past was made of nothing but sand. The professor looked concerned as he examined his box. It was then that we realized we were completely surrounded. The men seemed to think I was some kind of god, or, as it turned out, some kind of sacrifice. stalactite above me looked quite unstable, like it was ready to come down. As I got to the top of the cliff, I could see everyone else being led away in heavy chains. Their extravagantly dressed capturers were only moving them in a slow march, so I followed them at a safe distance. Strangely, the men seemed to ask the professor something, who nodded in agreement. Although they clearly knew each other, the man in charge pushed the professor into a small wooden cage, along with Preston and Logan. The men then left. I was about to attempt to free my friends when one of the men returned with some tools. It was then I heard some machinery start in the distance, and the man left again. I then found out what the machinery was.
Mr. Preston took a chance to do something I'm guessing he thought was brave, shouting, Catch you later, you ancient Egyptian dickweeds. This looks right. Stay here, whispered the professor, just in case. Sorry to take you on a less than excellent adventure, whispered the professor, his voice slowly weakening, but I knew he needed to see these things. I was always worried about the military possibilities, but I'm pleased to see your consciousness software is still growing. Life is a state of mind. I had no idea what he meant, but he looked so happy. Quick, shouted Mr. Logan, hide. I jumped into a large cupboard with Mr. Preston, who whispered something about seeing some people on the security monitor. The cupboard door was pretty thick so I couldn't really hear what was going on, but suddenly I heard Mr. Silton shout, run. When Mr. Preston eventually opened the door, we saw a large glowing light, exactly like the one from the professor's time machine. It was only then that I realized that we had reappeared just before we had left. As we walked back to the train station, Mr. Silton was truly confused. All he kept saying was, what the bloody hell happened? Soon we were all gathered around the dusty blackboard back at Mr. Silton's house. He was explaining what was an increasingly complicated plan. And that, ladies and gentlemen, he said, is the plan of the century. Sim explained that Heather and her mum were in Lab 33. He said I should find them then take them to the gate on the other side of the base. I nodded, even though I must have looked terrified. I'll need to register these two, he continued. Hopefully the guards won't notice I walked in with three robots and now only have two. He wished me luck and reminded me it was Lab 33, but you only need to tell a robot something once, 